thanks so much for coming, Jim. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us in the car. Uh, why don't you tell me a little bit of, you know, kind of who you are and what your background is? Yeah, sure. So, uh, my name is Jim. I'm uh, 31 years old. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't looking for the dating version. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. No, okay. I, I, I will leave out the, the, the year uh, then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, so I'm... Um, um, I'm living in the Netherlands, obviously, a uh, big proud fan of Rotterdam. Uh, our office is in Amsterdam. Uh -huh. I'm working for ABM Road Clearing for about four years now. Okay. Um, when, do we want to point out something about Rotterdam versus Amsterdam? We could, we could. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. uh, I always make the joke in um, in the office that I'm only hiring people from Rotterdam, so uh -huh. that slowly we move our headquarters to Rotterdam. <laughs> but it takes about a four, yeah, I think more 10, 20 years later. Than, right, uh, right. We have to show. Well, you need to like maybe start a, you know, like a sponsored like educational program in Rotterdam, you know, uh, specifically tailored to the kind of people that you That would need. actually be a very good idea. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, actually, that's that's win one already from this uh, from this conversation. <laughs> exactly, Amazing. exactly. Amazing. Your future startup or, or uh, you know, kind of a, an endeavor for ABN. Right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, no, but I'm um, I have a technical background. So I started uh, as a developer. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now I'm uh, a so-called chapter area lead, which might not uh, say, say Yeah, I saw that in your profile. <laughs> I was like, I uh, wonder what that means. Yeah, so in, in short, I'm responsible for our development teams in Europe. Okay. So we set up a uh, sort of chapter model uh, at the beginning of this year, which means that the, uh, the developers report into their chapter leads. And this, okay. this can be, for example, a Python chapter lead, Java chapter lead. Oh, oh it's kind of by technology exactly. is the chapter. Okay. Exactly. I was yeah. thinking it'd be more like by region. Um, Okay. Yeah, that is, actually, yeah. So we do it by by technology now. So that also mm -hmm. means that uh, because we, we have a global presence from an ABM rule clearing perspective, is that yeah. uh, even though my, maybe the Python developers might be in Sydney, Chicago, Amsterdam, yeah, that even they also communicate with each other and learn from uh, the best practices amongst each other. I gotcha. And so, what which uh, technology stack are you the chapter lead for? So I'm actually the chapter area lead. So I, uh, I then coach okay. the chapter leads again. So oh, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> Just uh, right. to make yeah. it even more yeah. complicated. Yeah. But no, I'm um, originally my my base stack was uh, Python based. Okay. Uh, did a little bit of Java as well. A yeah. little bit of Angular. Then you Node. thought better of it and went back to Python. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. Yeah. Uh, no. No. No offense for right. Java. I did Java for too. ten years or something. Ah. Okay. But so yeah, I did. I did a lot of Java. Nice. Um, and every other language, but you know, <laughs> into that. Um, yeah. I mean, in general, I still believe that if you if you develop once, it's sort of a mindset that you learn. Of course, there are there are nuances in every language. But yeah. At least you have a mindset of developing and that helps a lot. That is one of the things that I continuously rant about with the uh, tech hiring market is yep. like, you know, do you really need to find somebody who specifically has, you know, five years of experience with Python with this particular module? Or exactly. can you find somebody who knows how to program for a bunch of years and you can just teach them Python in that particular module? Exactly, um, exactly. You know, Couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it really kind of drives me crazy because it's like, I know how to do a for loop. <laughs> I just sometimes need to know the syntax for that particular language. And yeah. let's be honest, if you don't know something, the first thing you do, it, well, it, yeah. it used to be right. Stack Overflow, there's right. now a new tool on the market, oh. which for, uh, let's say, uh, popularity purposes, I won't name it here, because okay. I think LinkedIn has been flooded uh, with it recently. Okay. I might still do it, ChatGTP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think okay. uh, LinkedIn has been uh, flooded with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually have a nice little Python tool on the command line called How Do I, which uh, will actually search Stack Overflow and give you a response all from the command line. So you, you don't amazing. even have to, like, break out the browser. Uh, so you Amazing. Know, so you should yeah, share that also. Amazing. For sure. That's yeah, uh, yeah. amazing. It's called How Do I. It's very nice. I didn't write it. I just use it. I, ah, but I okay. promote it all the time. Nice. Um, but yeah. I mean, that, that's what a developer uh, makes a good developer, right? In the end. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it was funny. I used to, uh, you know, because I was traveling all the time uh, and, you know, I always have these grand plans of what I was going to work on while I was on the plane and then realized I can't actually code unless I have the internet as yep. well. Yeah. Um, you know, so. Very, uh, sounds very familiar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So uh, we talked a little bit about. Um, sorry, my directions just decided it was uh, gonna not do them anymore. Um, it okay. might also be that we end up in Rotterdam. This yeah, yeah, year. could That's, be. Uh, I've never been there, so why not? Oh, you should, you should visit. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you, I mean, so you work uh, at a, you know, uh, a clearing rate to a, a, a bank. Um, yeah. Yep. And uh, but what is it about kind of the open source world, or what, you know, how involved have you been in open source? I mean, you use Python, so yep. you probably have some exposure. Um, but True. what, where does that fit into your kind of professional or even non-professional life? 
So I think the, um, that's actually a good question. So from an open source perspective, the, um, uh, I've always found it more important to be able to use the open source version of anything that's available. Mm -hmm. uh, not only because it's from a business perspective hugely cheaper than, uh, than the commercial yeah, version, yeah. Uh, but also because the, the sort of the, um, uh, the intelligence of the crowd is always so much larger than an individual could ever do. Yeah, 100%. Exactly. So I, I, I'd like to contribute. Um, I, I did a bit from a Google perspective uh, in my early years. Mm. Uh, also, from a Python perspective, I've uh, contributed a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I must admit, in my new role, I I've tried to develop uh, a bit from time to time. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I always told myself I want to keep it uh, in development one day a week. Right, right. How's that going for you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, one, one day every two months? Uh, probably, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think I'm happy if I do two, three hours a, a, a week well, now. Part of, but, uh, part of me going back to going to academia was like, oh, maybe I can write code again. Exactly. Uh, I can imagine yeah, that. Yeah, not yeah. so much. No? No, that's no? Not a lot. Not a lot. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think it's, you know, part of it is I think, uh, you know, even though, you know, I'm fairly senior in, in the tech world, yeah. you know, I'm, you know, a two year out of college, college professor, ah. right? Like, as in, you know, I'm still learning how to do all that stuff. And I didn't have a lot of the exposure that I think a lot of, um, you know, kind of professors do going up through the normal path of like, you know, cause I, I was never a TA anywhere, yeah, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it's like, it's all been kind of self-taught, you know, except yeah. that, you know, I've done a lot of like conferences and workshops and all that jazz, um, but I haven't, you know, but teaching a classroom is, is a different experience. Completely. Yeah. 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 Um, so, but yes, I have not had enough time uh, to do the programming. <laughs> uh, so, you know, but we're, I'm getting more efficient. So I'm getting closer. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's very, from a leadership perspective, right? Uh, I, I know you talked about open source before, but. I think um, it's really hard to find people who actually know how to coach a bit and li li like to explain stuff and also yeah. are quite technically advanced still. Uh -huh. uh, and I know I now know why, because as soon as you sort of reach, uh, let's say, one level higher, it's you're consumed by other things and development. Right, right. Or the uh, one of the things I used to say too is like, I uh, you know I had a cube for a long time in, in the various jobs I had, and eventually I was promoted to like a management level or whatever, and I, I finally got an office with a door, and I found <laughs> out what why the door is terrible because it means you have to have closed door conversations yep. you know yep. about you know someone's underperformance or you know uh, you know things like that and it's like these are not I don't want to have these conversations I want everyone to be awesome exactly, you know? exactly. Um, yeah. and uh, yeah and so I realized that I didn't actually want the door uh, yeah. once I had one that's actually quite a nice way of explaining it yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I completely agree yeah. Uh, yeah. as soon as you have the closed door conversation the conversations usually don't get better <laughs> right right exactly uh, so okay so so you've been trying to do some coding. It's been yep. going, you know, you've done a bit. Yeah. Um, and yep. uh, mostly like kind of contributing to things you use or trying to build stuff on the side or? Yeah, both. I think a, a bit, con uh, I contributed a bit in the early days of Kubernetes mm -hmm. back then. It was, um, was really nice to, uh, back then, it sounds like, I, I told you I'm 31, <laughs> but it's still, uh, right. it, it sounds like 20 years ago. ago. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, but the Kubernetes, of course, was really, let's say, a disruption uh, um, from a technology perspective. And you mm -hmm. see that multiple companies, including ours, in all honesty, are still making that transition towards containers. And we're doing right. quite well now, that's, which is nice. Yeah, that is nice. Uh, but that's one of the, let's say, big disruption uh, categories that were there. And so, uh, and that's kind of leads to my, my next question is that, you know, what do you find kind of characteristically or fundamentally or whatever different about, you know, what they call cloud native development or, um, you know, that kind kind of style uh, versus not, right? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a good question. Again, a good question, actually. But um, Periodically, I, I, I have them. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, yeah. it's going quite well. I mean, 100% score so far. Right. No, but I think the um, from a cloud native perspective, and I think that's both from a private and public cloud perspective, the, mm -hmm. uh, the cloud native part, is that if you're going to use native services, regardless of the platform that you're using, mm -hmm. you actually get most out of it. And I think there's always a discussion, which is a valid one, of course. Uh, between the say, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. the exit strategy, vendor right. lock, which is fine, of course, but I think, um, and I think I, I've had those discussions with our architecture teams, mm -hmm. and n no bad words about our architecture team, because <laughs> I, I love you still. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's always a certain... Don't worry, no one will ever hear this. Okay, so, cool, yeah. well, okay, that's fine. Exactly. No, I, yeah. no, I still love him. <laughs> no, but still, I think the... Um, if you're looking at a vendor lock-in from only when you're doing cloud native stuff, I think you're lying to yourself because mm -hmm. uh, vendor lock-in is not something that only exists when you do cloud native. Mm -hmm. It might be a bit more apparent because the focus is there. Right. But um, if, if you have a complete landscape of, uh, let's say, Linux servers, VMs that are hosted by maybe even an external contracting party, an external vendor, 
uh, then trying to move to a new technology, I mean, good luck with that. That's also going to be a 10 year program to do that. Right, so, right. Uh, lock in is always, uh, is always there. Right. Um, yeah, one of the things uh, you kind of are putting it nicely, like it's more obvious. Like when, uh, when I was in some of the consulting I was doing, we were, we were first trying to get people to move to the cloud. And um, they would talk about like how uh, concerned they were about the security of the access into their environments. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm, and so then I would essentially proceed into a discussion of how many nightly batches do you run with how many different partners that all have custom firewall punches you know what you might actually find is that when you move to the cloud well everything will break but you will actually find out how many holes you actually exactly. had yeah, um, yeah. you know and and I think that the what's nice about those native services is is your I think you're you're more clearly making a choice yep. to choose that vendor or whatever than you did sometimes in the past where you were just kind of firing off this API over here and nobody really knew what it was. Um, and so I think it's a little, uh, it's a little simpler to have a, like you said, visibility into, well, where is our vendor lock? Exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, and, I, and I think, I think the one sort of common phrase within in, in development has always been that you should focus on where you can deliver value. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, we've always thought that we had to host our own infrastructure because, well, that's part of what you do when you do IT. Right, right. And I'm happy that that sort of the view is slowly, well, slowly going away. Mm -hmm. um, because in the end, we want to actually run our code because that's what delivers value in right, the end, much right. more than running our own servers, stacks, VMs, right. so that sort of stuff. Right. You're not a cloud hosting provider. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That abstraction yeah. layer goes up and up and up even a, bit, a bit further by time. So I'm also trying in our organization, uh, of course, right, there's always a sort of stigma on a bank because a bank is mm -hmm. old and I, I won't say that we don't have, uh, have legacy systems uh, in, our, uh, in our case. But I do see that we, we are moving towards uh, a more native approach, both from a public uh, perspective and, uh, and private perspective. Uh -huh. And you find that most of the kind of engineers or architects or whatever, like, are they kind of immediately getting it? Or is there a lot of uh, kind of tra training, for lack of a better term, but basically teaching of how to understand that better? Yeah, I think that there's there's some developers. Of course, there's always a group that's, that's so sort of enthusiastic that they found it out by themselves. Yeah, and yeah. they've already found it out way before the company, <laughs> right, right. Which, which is always cool. Uh, but I think there's a big misconception that sort of um, uh, using private, or sorry, um, the, the cloud native services mm -hmm. is just uh, replatforming, for example. But that, there's a completely uh, yeah, different yeah. mindset involved right. in developing cloud native. It requires different skill sets. So we, we do try to train yeah. quite frequently as well. Um, well, I think it's, it's particularly difficult because you you can develop systems in the cloud that are very traditional. It's just it, you know, and 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 it's super easy to fall into that trap. Yep. Um, and you really aren't taking advantage of of what it means to to have that you know kind of distributed infrastructure um, that is really where all the benefit is. Exactly. Know? Exactly. And I think that the the mistake that we tend to make sometimes, of course, you, you probably know the seven R's of AWS as well. Let's say replatform, re refactor, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And what we sometimes make as a mistake is that we just get our current application, we throw it all in the same container, and then we host it containerized, right, and then we right. say, no, well, now, yeah. now we're actually cloud native. Although I will <laughs> say, my guidance for a long time to people was, if you if you were trying to bring something, you know, to a container or whatever, is actually to do that to start, right? Yeah, and then kind of start to pair off the services, you know. But don't let the the you know you have to re-architect the whole thing gate you from even taking the first step, exactly. which can be you know a little bit scary because all the documents tells you well you can't run more than one application per container and all this other stuff and it's like you're better off kind of starting to think container um, even if you're not quite doing it right exactly uh, you know as quickly as possible than you are to to wait you know exactly um, yeah. yeah it was actually I mean in a lot of ways that's why the big push behind like service oriented architecture kind of didn't take off very well so it was all top down it was yep. all boil the entire ocean yep. and then you get some benefit um, you know whereas the microservices model is you know don't just start this tiny little bit you know and keep building and building and building yeah um, yep. even though they're as I said, actually, in another interview, they're just still services. It's just true. Yeah, you know, yeah. But yeah, uh, but it makes a difference. I think you, you touched you touched upon the the microservices. I think there's always, as it is with everything, right? There's a balance between where your productivity or productivity is. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about microservices, then if you um, uh, peel off 
very specific services from an existing application, that's also a great way to start uh, building a containerized uh, application mm -hmm. uh, because it also makes it a lot smaller and easier to start with, right? That's the right, uh, right, yeah. Yeah, but it, but you don't have to kind of do it all at once. You can True. do you know, yeah, piece exactly. by piece. Exactly. Um, so, so uh, you I think have been working primarily with OpenShift, or thinking about OpenShift, or you're mostly you know kind of native Kubernetes. Yeah, we're using OpenShift now for I think um, well, six or seven years. Oh now. wow. Okay. So yeah. Uh, not yeah, recent. but it's, <laughs> now the interesting part comes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because we've we've been using it for six or seven years. Uh, that's when we first started sort of the, the talks about going towards OpenShift because hosting our own Kubernetes platform again. It's not something that's our, in our core business, so why mm -hmm. should we do it ourselves then? Mm -hmm. It's better to let someone manage the platform or manage the cluster that, uh, well, have um, have proven experience with it. Mm -hmm. But still, t nowadays, and that's I think our biggest challenge, we have, um, let's say about 10 to 15% of our applications have moved. Mm. And we do see, let's say, see the exponential growth now, the, the platform consumability is, is going up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's been, um, well, a, a tough journey to get uh, get to move over, right? Because also, it's it's not only from a tech perspective. If you also never look is. at the product, yeah. or no, <laughs> never is. Yeah. If we have to make money in the end, and uh, the people in the, that have the decision power, of course, don't see direct value in making that shift, right? If mm -hmm. you're rebuilding, replatforming. Yeah, there's no new features. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, and it's it's always so tough, to, right, to write a uh, you know a cost saving story, um, you know, and uh, you know because most of the time it's like you know I'd rather I'd rather operate a you know a new feature story, um, you know, or or sell uh, particularly for those kinds of people. Um, so you know, I think most of my work has always been around trying to make sure that uh, you know, in consulting or whatever, it's like, oh yeah, you're gonna get this thing and this thing and this thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and by the way, we're also gonna replatform. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's, that's the perfect way of doing it. It's, yeah. it's really true. Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, we are working for a bank, obviously. So right. what, what always uh, works great, and it's not even a lie to be honest. It's actually, very true as well. Your risk appetite also right. is, is, right. is much better than it was before if you actually do make that step. Right, yeah. And that's because, well, banks are quite risk averse, which is a good thing. Right, um, well, that helps. Yeah, except when they're not, and that's usually a bad thing. That's, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. We, we saw some examples recently. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, we, uh, like I said, uh, you know, I did a lot of consulting and financial services and, yeah. you know, just between, um, you know, and, and it was interesting, even within the same bank, different parts of it being way more or less risk averse, Yeah, yeah uh, which is also yeah. really interesting, um, you know, go kind of where the customers are, right? Um, yeah, but I think that's actually an interesting point because being sort of risk averse and innovation usually doesn't go together mm -hmm. that well. Yeah. So I think even, um, well, I'm, I'm not generally a fan of doing forced uh, proof of concepts and forcing people into a room uh -huh. to do uh, something new because right. we have to do it. Right. But in these kinds of concepts and these kinds of environments, it does sometimes work to really get people in a room and do something completely isolated from what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, just to get them in touch with the new technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you can get lost in day-to-day in -day business if you don't do that from time to time. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny, like, you know, you have the, like, lunch and learns, kind of. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of the time, you know, they don't seem to be kind of very effective, at least in my experience, um, you know, or things like that, where it's kind of like, it's happening so regularly that, you know, people aren't really kind of, like, considering it as, like, part of their job to yeah. go to those kinds of things. So I really like some of the, um, you know, a lot of organizations are starting to do, uh, I can't think what it's typically called, but basically like, you know, like a Hacktoberfest kind yep. of model yep. um, or whatever, where they take maybe a week, a quarter, or a week every, you know, year or who knows, um, and actually have all of their employees, all the developer employees, uh, or actually we've seen docs and stuff like that too, actually go and, and contribute to some open source projects yep. that are like completely unrelated to the organization. Um, so that you can kind of like get that spark back again, yep. you know, get yep. some exposure to different ways of doing things. Cause you know, I think a lot of the time when you just, if you're working just with the same kind of people and the same development models and stuff like that, you, you just don't see new ways to do it. You exactly. Know? Um, exactly. It's easy to stay in that box and don't get out of it. Right, really, right. Uh, and yeah. sometimes, well, sometimes I don't think you necessarily even know you're in the box, right? You know, True. it's like, the, oh, there's walls out there, yeah. you know, yeah. until you see somebody who's doing something completely different. Yeah. Um, and uh, it really does change your mind, yeah. uh, you know. And I think, and, and a big part of that kind of cloud native adoption or whatever is like you 
it, it's fundamentally architecturally different. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. if you're not seeing that part of it, you're not really, you often are not going to be able to take advantage of exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that makes it difficult, right? Because usually if you, if you take the decision makers in the company, mm -hmm. it's even harder for them to explain why it is fundamentally different. And if the development teams don't get that new concept either, mm -hmm. for them, they won't explain it to the, de to the decision makers either. Right, so it makes right. it really hard to make that movement going. Right. So what have you found, uh, you know, so you said recently you've really been seeing adoption curve kind of go up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what what do you think has been that driver? Is it, are you doing something different? Is it snowball effect? Is it, you know, yeah. what, what kind of hint do you have for people listening to the show um, f for them to be able to get other people to adopt things? So I think it's two, it's two main drivers. I think one of them is the, uh, the service oriented part from a platform perspective. Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the pitfalls that we had in the past is that the, the platform team is actually making sure that the developers have the ability to develop on OpenShift, for example, or AWS mm -hmm. whatsoever that they actually are developing the platform for our developers to work on. And right. because they're technicians themselves as well, they also like to make the platform as perfect for themselves to work with, but sometimes forget the customer on, on the LRM. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And that's one thing that's really going well recently, also because of the communication between both uh -huh. parties. And I think that the second part is related, but it has to do with the consumability of the platform. Yeah. So what you see happening, there's, there's of course always when you move to a new platform, and in this case also a new way of thinking, Yeah. A huge learning curve for everyone. Right. Uh, and to make it even more complex, I think in most corporates you have also various different uh, departments that all want to have a say in security, compliance, Oh, sure, sure, yeah. And yeah. if you have every single team going through that same process, then both security, governance and compliance, and architecture by the way, mm -hmm. will get tired of telling the same story all over again. <laughs> yeah. And development yeah. teams all take about, well, uh, let's say a year to actually make that shift. Yeah. So what we did is um, we're not in implementing. My experience also developer teams are not all that patient. So you know, so. I rest my case. That's uh, I, I can completely relate from my previous experience. Right, uh, right. Yeah. So, so not your we, current company, though, of course. No, no, yeah, obviously yeah, not. Perfect obviously. in every way. Uh, yeah. Love you, ABN. So yeah. We're looking for people still, by the way. That's, oh, uh, hint, hint. Self promotion. Yeah. 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 Anyway, um, so what, what, what we did, we actually put a team bet between our platform and um, product teams which we, we call development services, which is mm -hmm. sort of, uh, I mean, what's in the name. Um, but what, what they actually do is uh, create consumable constructs that our developers can just pull from any repo. So we have, of course, our own uh, internal Git repos. Yep. But there are consumable uh, Docker files, Jenkins files, uh, OpenShift uh, template YAMLs, mm -hmm. all, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but already with the, with the requirements from the platform team, the security team, governance, compliance, and architecture baked in. Right. So right. that means that they're pre-approved, yep. uh, consumable, and it works in our environment, which means that they don't have to start all the way from scratch. Uh, and that's something you see that the adoption is, is really going uh, going well so far. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm wholeheartedly in agreement. One of the things that I actually think is interesting that I've seen a few organizations do is also do rotation. Yep. So you actually have some of the you know normal developer teams. You know, one of their members uh, joins the developer enablement team yep. for a few months, uh, you know, or a year or whatever, um, and then you know, kind of rotating back through. It's kind of similar to the model of you know, if you're doing you know a software product and you actually rotate your kind of core engineers through maintenance um, and making sure or even customer support yeah uh, yeah, which also it, helps. <laughs> yeah because it, it really gives you a uh, kind of like a, a, a real touch point and it's one of the things I, I work on with our students is like trying to get them to understand that you know this data or this application or whatever there's there's like people on the other side yep, you know yep. and and you need to be aware that every row in that database data set or whatever is a human yep. um, and you know I think forcing a developer back to those touch points really makes a difference in how they focus their work. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so I thought that was a cool idea. No, for, for sure. <laughs> and I think if you, um, uh, well, me as a developer, I will talk from my own uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. I think getting that, uh, that touch back with your actually end customer, be it someone internal or some yeah. team internal yeah. or external, 
also gives you a great better vibe of uh, a feeling of value, right? You want to be, you, yeah. You want yeah. your work to matter, and if you don't right. know how it matters, then it's really hard to uh, to make that value. Yeah. No. Totally. And you know, and I don't know. You also get the, you know, sometimes, not all the time, but you get a little bit of the pat on the back, you know, yeah, yeah, like, hey, sure. somebody, yeah. you know, actually likes the stuff we build. I think it's extremely important yeah. to, to have. Yeah. yeah. That recognition yeah. of your work is just is, is very important. Yeah. Yeah. Although, you know, I spent a lot of my career as a fixer, and so most of the time, <laughs> you know, all I was there was to get yelled at. Uh, so, you know, but but then I fixed it. So, you know. And then you make people happy anyway. <laughs> right. And Maybe then I disappear and, yeah. and made sure the team takes the credit so that they can continue. Exactly. Um, but, well, but yeah. it's all that's very noble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> there's something. Uh, but it, it's uh, certainly a lot of fun. Yeah. Look at that Volkswagen Bug. Oh, wow. That's really yeah. nice. Yeah. Uh, old school. Like, a, that's like a 73, 72. It looks like um, a nice color as well. Yeah. yeah. I had I had one that was uh, like dark blue, but it was a 75, so it was like a super beetle. Yeah. Um, but then chrome everywhere on it. It was <laughs> gorgeous. First time I turned it on, though, uh, the entire steering column lit on fire. Um, okay. So, yeah, the first thing I had to do was rewire uh, a lot of it. Nice. Uh, yeah, I didn't have working uh, windshield wipers for a while. Um, and then I went through a sprinkler and realized that maybe I needed working windshield wipers. Well, you know, but I, I had a lot of fun fixing that I car. I can imagine. I mean, it's <laughs> also part of the fun of having one, right? right I can right. imagine. Yeah. Uh, and it's a very straightforward engine. So, <laughs> you, can, you know, basically anybody can do it. Well, so, like, I couldn't. Uh, it, well, there was, a, there was a great book and my, uh, my father actually uh, had a bit of a, you know, mechanical bent. Uh, and so he would guide me when I got really stuck. Uh, but for the most part, I, you know, there was the, what was it? The Zen? No. It was, there was the Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, but there was like a similar book for Volkswagen Bugs. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I basically told you how the entire car worked. It's so you just break it out and, you know, start tinkering with stuff. I mean, the worst you could do was like make it not run. Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't running anyway. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> Doesn't make it any worse. Though. Yeah, that's, exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's uh, cool. Yeah, it was. It was pretty neat. Um, you know, these days, you know, with the electrics and all that jazz, you know, it's no one's no one's gonna have any idea how cars work. No. 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 <laughs> um, I, just, I don't think we know how it work anymore. Like I, I didn't know this that. Um, so even if you have a gas powered engine, yeah. A lot of the time, the um, uh, whatever you call it, like the soundproofing in yeah, the, yeah. is so good that you actually can't hear the engine. And so the engine noise you hear inside the cab is actually manufactured. You're kidding. Yeah. Really? Or or it'll have like a pipe basically. Just so, so they, you can just so you can hear it. Wow. Yeah. I was like, whoa. I didn't know it's from electrical cars, right? That they have to make outside noise at least to be yeah, known. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I as a regular pedestrian uh, where <laughs> they don't make a lot of outside noise, uh, yeah, I'm often terrified to cross yeah. the street. Well, I, I also drive electric. It's, it's yeah. Amazing just, just to, to creep up on people and they yeah. just shout. No, I, yeah. I don't get it in real life. But it's, it's, it's really nice. To it's, do. it's one of those things that if you were an evil person, you would like to exactly. do. It's exactly. like it's like tauntingly there, yeah. but you yeah. know you can't actually do it. No. Yeah. No, I totally understand. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I, I think this has been great. Uh, yeah. You know, and uh, you know, Saint, thank you so much for joining us in the in the cool car, and uh, hopefully you had a nice tour of Amsterdam. Um, I mean, it's no Rotterdam, but you know. I was uh, gonna say. I was yeah. gonna say. No, yeah. thank you so much for for having me and. Uh, um, it's uh, n next time we should do it in Rotterdam, but I will yeah. invite you over then to, to right, do it there. Right. Yeah, well, you just have to find us a car. Yeah, no, don't worry, don't worry. Yeah, no. yeah. We can do it in my uh, Volkswagen E Golf. Uh, then, uh, <laughs> no worries. Right, right. It'll, it'll. I, I can only interview at maximum one half of a person. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I'm, I'm not that tall anyway. So that's, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs>